G'day listeners and welcome to another APS News Bulletin, keeping you up to date and well informed on everything in the Australian housing market in real time. Now today guys, we have got over from Thailand, our resident building expert, Mr. Big Liam Corey, mate, back in, flown in from Coast to Wii, mate. You're living in uh, in paradise, buddy. How are you, mate? Welcome back to the show. How are you, Sammy? Thank you for having me again. We're, we're both living in uh, different sides of paradise, man. The, the GC is definitely a uh, paradisal place, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, we were having a laugh because uh, you had the nice temps over there. I was out in the in the Ferrari on the way here this morning, roof down. It was about 10 a.m. with a, with a 23, 24 degrees in the middle of winter. Mate, we're recording this in the middle of July. So, uh, mate, you can't get much better than that in Australia. I've got to, uh, I've got to take it at 100% is, is our little piece of paradise, mate. So, but man, in a, in a quick, funny little little quip, you've got a, you've got a fella out the back on his motorbike or his chainsaw or something. That's going to be funny. But hopefully the, uh, hopefully the audience can still hear what you've got to bring some value. Man, I know you keep your finger on the pulse of the building industry and man it's it's an interesting time uh, we have a lot of people still writing in going yep look we love that we love the updates please keep the updates coming on the building con- and construction sector because obviously it does have such a key impact on the housing market especially where we're at right now in shortages so mate what i want to do is i want to run through have a bit of a discussion with you about this and uh and then yeah man let, let's do uh you know the new the news bulletin around the construction sector now if you guys out there are loving this if you love this uh this uh weekly news bulletin make sure you let us know and we'll keep this a little bit more regular with the big bearded beast from coast samui himself all right jumping straight in guys story number one construction of nearly forty thousand homes across australia in limbo article by nine news guys reads the construction work on nearly 40,000 homes across Australia has yet to start despite them being given building approvals, new research shows. An analysis from KPMG Australia reveals Sydney and Melbourne account for almost half of approved but not yet commenced apartments, townhouses and houses. Brisbane recorded an 8% increase in stalled housing over the five-year trend according to KPMG figures. The ACT set a record for dwellings approved but not begun, nearly doubling from this time last year from 864 non-started to 1,700 and 72. Adelaide and Perth remain stable, interestingly, and high costs in building materials over recent years and the interest rate spikes have been blamed for the construction lag. Now, mate, Big Liam, what are your thoughts on that, mate? Construction, nearly 40,000 homes across Australia in limbo. So they've got approvals, they've been ready to start and they haven't begun construction. They haven't started. Mate, what are your thoughts on that? Like, give us give us the weighted opinion, my friend. Yeah, Sammy. Look, it's um, <clears throat> it's not surprising given what we've seen in uh, in the construction industry, particularly over the last couple of years. We've seen a lot of those areas. You know, we can see that Sydney and Melbourne have been affected the hardest, or even ACT. But as you know, like look at the the price spikes that those areas had. Builders just have had a hard time keeping up with the rising cost of good inflation, actually turning over a profit. Um, one thing that's interesting with a lot of that housing is it's actually larger projects like your townhouses and, and or medium and high density uh, stuff Pardon that's been delayed. The, yeah. yeah. And, um, and that's the hardest thing to make a profit on. I mean, when labor's short, um, you, you've got high interest and in inflation uh, tapering rising on, you've got contracts. Costs contracts that were probably fixed two, maybe even three years ago, um, just because of all the red tape it takes to, to get it through to construction. Uh, not surprisingly, people are probably at a point where, yeah, the project's approved, but maybe they've got that hard time uh, turning over a profit. One thing I saw in my time in the industry, this was something that we, we saw coming up, was um, just a simple fact that... Um, you know, when new stock coming on, obviously people and builders are able to regain uh, certain margins that they'd have. And obviously if they're faced with new stock versus old stock, the I guess the priority would be for them to bring the new stock in first. And we see this, I, I hear it from boots on the ground from people that uh, you know I still have in the industry that a lot of builders are still favoring the new stock, even though they've got a lot of people and a lot of houses and stuff that's been sitting there for a while a lot of the contractors and people taking the projects, they're quick to take the new stuff because that's what's turning over a profit, whereas the old stuff's sitting there a little bit because no one wants to touch it. So just to, just to recap on that, so what you're saying is there's, there's older contracts that are maybe like one, two years old, but because they're older and they're older pricing and they're actually probably going to lose money or break even at best on those projects because of how old they are or on those contracts, they're actually opting to go for the newer builds and the newer contracts that have been signed and they can kind of start almost immediately and that they know they're going to turn a profit on rather than, than actually go back and start on these deals further down the line. 
from previous previous times. Hundred percent. I've I've heard it. Um, I've seen it. Like having boots on the ground, man. I, I was even. I mean, one of my granny flats was being built uh, last year. And I was talking to the supervisor and he was telling me the same thing. He's like, oh, you know, new houses, we're, we're flying through at the moment. Like the new stuff's getting in. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, geez, this has taken 12 months to get my granny flat built. Mm. And they're getting them done quicker now for the newer stuff. But that's because they're more incentived. Uh, the, the contractors are actually like turning over a profit, whereas the old stock, it's hard getting the contractors over to actually do it. Um, and that's kind of an issue with labor shortage as well, because there's not a lot of labor. The people that are there, um, the guys in high demand, they want to take the ones that are offering bigger money, whereas of they're course. trying to get other people to fill in the other spots. So, yeah. Of course, man. We actually we actually witnessed this a lot both in um, Brisbane. It, 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 like this is quite this is a few years ago now with a different builder. We were originally working with in Brizzy for grannies and in Perth as well for a different for a decent like it was a different period there where the builders tried to look after us of giving us a heads up when a price a building price increase had come through and sometimes it was like ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So we'd get all these guys that were like umming and ahhing about doing a contract and going, guys, there's a price increase is about to come. You want to jump in and do it now? But then they'd sign them at that money and then they wouldn't start for like four to six months and then it was such a slow. slow to actually get those builds through and completed. And the biggest reason that I that I, I honestly believe it was was because they signed those contracts so cheap, they almost shouldn't have given us the heads up because it was so hard for them to complete them at a profit if they even complete them at a profit at all, um, you know, or, um, or, or even at a break even. So they kind of had to like filter them through with new jobs coming through that they actually were making money on. So they weren't, you know, bleeding too much doing these jobs further in. So it was, that was kind of my first real, um, uh, you know, sight into into the way that that works from that perspective. And a lot of the time, and, and people think builders have been dogs for doing it, but they're actually keeping themselves afloat because if they just went out and smashed out all these super low contracts and they kept trying to catch up and chase and just constantly be trying to catch themselves on that front, they, they're, they're going to go under because they can't, they can't, there's not enough profit in it, right, to do it like that. Whereas when they're kind of mixing and filtering it through with the newer stuff that's signed, that they've got that margin built in and they've got that healthy profit built in from that side, it kind of allows them to filter those other builds through and and yeah, we've seen, unfortunately, with a few builds and even a few builds have dragged out beyond the 12 months, unfortunately, but it's like they signed, they took ages to sign and then they finally got assigned and then took ages to get the, you know, it was old pricing and then took ages to get the funding and just as the slower it gets, the slower and slower it literally drags out. So, uh, man, it's an interesting way of looking at it. So, so obviously one of the biggest things there is, is, is projects not really working and then not starting. And then I think one of the other big things too, man, is like just to throw one extra thing in your spanner in the works of the construction sector of, man, people signing contracts, one, two, three years ago. Um, but, and specifically, it was two to three years ago when interest rates were at, let's say, three sub 3%. And now they're actually needing to lock in the funding and the finance. And now the interest rates are sitting at, you know, six, seven percent. And then they're trying to get the funding at that money, um, you know, at the same money, but at three times the interest rate, they may not actually service. So then they're kind of like, they've got the approval to start the build, but then they can't get the, they can't get the formal approval from the loan side of things to actually physically start the build from a loan, a loan approval side as well. So now I think there's a lot of things sort of weighing into this at the moment as well. But as we can see, um, nearly uh, more than half, sorry, is obviously C Sydney and Melbourne. Melbourne, you know, being approved but not yet commenced to a much lesser extent, all those other states. And realistically, it even shows the stability of markets at the moment, like Adelaide and Perth, that they aren't being affected, that they're still sweet. Brisbane's number's quite low as well. Um, but maybe a little bit of shakiness in those other states. But, mate, let's move on from that, man. Appreciate the insights from that side. Man, the next story I've got to dive into here with you, and I really want to know your opinion on this. Uh, it's a pretty pretty, uh, pretty grim uh, headline, we'll put it that way. Um, but Big Leith Van Onselen, who always likes to weigh in on our, uh, on our weekly news bulletins, his headline is the Aussie housing construction collapses into the black hole. Mate, You've got a black abyss. It's of a different kind, but mate, we're talking about the construction sector collapsing. I'm going to dive into his article, mate. And I want to know your thoughts on this. The data surrounding this is this is what Big Leith has written here. The data surrounding the Australian housing construction continues to deteriorate, making a mockery of the Albanese government's target to build 1.2 million homes over the next five years, which we're already a year into. The latest data from the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, revealed that only 12,400 homes were approved for construction in 
March, which was the lowest uh, monthly number since April 2012. So, guys, going back 12 years here, um, the lowest month of approvals in construction for that over that time period. On an annualized basis, only a, uh, sorry, 150,000 homes were approved for construction in March in trend terms. That is roughly 90,000 homes below the Albanese uh, government's annual housing target of 240,000 homes a year. This article goes on to say that the only realistic solution to Australia's housing shortage is to reduce demand by cutting overseas net migration and cutting it hard. Now, Liam, cutting the overseas net, net migration is not going to add to the to the to the build numbers. It's not going to turn that one hundred and fifty thousand homes into two hundred and forty thousand homes. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Cutting cutting the net overseas migration in the first year of this of the Albanese government's you know two hundred and forty thousand uh, target uh, of homes per year being built. We're already ninety thousand short in the first year. Man, what do you what are your thoughts around this? What's your opinion? Firstly, um, my opinion is that you have the larger black abyss of the two of us. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, talking about but, hair look, on the I, head I, for I, all of those that are I'm unsure. It's a, yes, it's the it's the hair on the head. Yes, moving yes. on, mate. Moving um, on. <laughs> um, no, but I, I think um, I, I'd actually disagree with Leith on this one. Um, I, I think what we saw is a massive downturn of migration. During COVID, obviously, we weren't bringing anyone in, and um, we, we've always, we've been low on labour shortage for a long time, right? Uh, uh, one of the biggest faults, I guess, in the migration policy that they have, which certain states are trying to correct right now, uh, you look at WA, very much uh, skillfully targeting the right type of migrants to bring in uh, much needed labour in the construction industry, which is very forward thinking. Most other states haven't really done that. And the migration policy has just been bringing in a lot of people that aren't necessarily contributing to our issue. I think that's the biggest problem. I think one of the solutions is in migration. And we've covered this before. We've, we've sort of mentioned it previous times. But I don't think it's the issue. I think it is the solution. However, it needs to be targeted because there are a lot of overseas skilled migrants we make it very hard for them to actually come over and utilize their skills. I yes. think states need to work a little bit harder in terms of recognizing skill sets so that we can plug some of the holes. I mean, the issue isn't just in construction. It's like so many industries are affected by the lack of targeted migration for skill sets that we desperately need in the country. Fortunately, construction is one of the big ones that's really struggling. And, you know, covering on our previous article, one of the things that can obviously in terms of price increases, it's not just material costs or inflation, it's competition, right? And um, when we have fewer labors or laborers, um, you know, they're in demand and they're That's able right. to set higher pricing. 100%. So we were seeing massive rate increases, not just on the material side, but also from prices that our laborers were charging. I mean, I saw price for brick laborers go from like 80 to 90 cents uh, up to two dollars two fifty in a matter of two years right mm. the, the average cost to build a brick home literally doubled over that time and that was because they were in such high demand we couldn't get enough of them so they were just able to set their price that shouldn't have happened um one of the other issues on that is like we've seen a big exodus of baby boomer construction uh laborers so a lot of like people that made their wealth or at the retirement age of 50 60 had a huge exodus of them leave the industry not a lot of new uh new guys coming on to kind of fill their spot so yeah i, I personally think that uh migration isn't the issue the way they've been doing it has caused an issue um but i i, I do think that if they carefully target it and bring on the right sets of skills that we can actually use that as an advantage and kind of plug some of the holes that we need in terms of um you know trying to, to fix the issues there particularly from a labor shortage perspective yeah, hundred percent, man. I couldn't agree with you more. I actually think it was it was when I was over there with you, and we 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 did that. We did the uh, news bulletin when we we're over in Koh Samui, mate. And I remember us talking about the targeted actual labour. You know, when people are coming in, not just letting anyone in for any reason or whatever. It's actually bringing in that skilled workforce, so then they can kind of get to our standards. Which I, I think they were. I think as you as you were saying there, WA had almost like a fast tracked program um, specifically around the construction sector to get those guys out, like, like qualified to be able to actually work on our sites to our regulations and to our codes so then they could plug them straight into the workforce ASAP. So, man, I think I think you're 100% right there. And I think this is one of those things that, like, 
they, they push migration so hard because we had that deficit during the COVID period where, um, like, like you're saying, there are a lot of people left the workforce. Um, not a lot of people came in. Like we, we are a big um, net overseas uh, migration country. Like we, you know, that's how we, we grow a lot of, in terms of the population every single year. Um, and so we played a bit of catch up over that kind of 18 month period of very aggressive uh, internal, sorry, overseas migration coming into Australia. But I think this is where they did mess up in the sense of like, there was no real parameters around it. They just let anyone come in. And I agree with you, man, that like if they were to wind it back, they're not really going to solve the issue because you're not going to be able to get these skilled, you know, even kids getting them into apprenticeships and getting out there into the workforce. It's a three, four year turnaround before they're ready to actually add a lot of ability into the, into the labor market as well. Whereas if we can get those skilled migrants coming in, getting them to our code now standards, you know, within a minimum six to 12 month period, you know, kind of get them out there in the workforce. Um, for one, man, we can keep that, the, keep that labor cost down, as you're saying there, like when the Brickies went on their big run, but then also actually help hold building prices down and allow building to increase because we have so many trades now and keeping them at that at that price point that makes it buildable and viable and feasible to actually go out there and construct and we've actually got the workforce to complete the construction as well so man i couldn't agree more with you on it it's um it's funny mate might have to put you and uh you and leith in the cage uh, over this disagreement but um but mate is there anything else you want to throw in i like it man it's uh it's 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 a counter it's not counterintuitive it's kind of kind of kind of cyclical to what a lot of other people are out there kind of saying and talking about. They're all just talking about winding it back down, but they're targeting it, doing it in the right way. Obviously we can see the benefits that could come off the back of it as well, but mate, anything else you want to throw in to, to wrap us up? Mate, I'll just uh, go on to say that, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely, uh, and even in terms of builders, not a plug on builders whatsoever. We saw literally every single trade set go up massively. It was just, you know, that's what happens when you're in high demand. So, um, but, but no, I think like, carefully targeting it you know probably best kept for another episode maybe but you know we're not we're, we're not plugging Is that hole you look at apprenticeship people. programs yeah yeah we, like you look at apprenticeship <laughs> programs and all that stuff massive dropout rates in that so as a country we're not doing the right things to um bring in the, the much needed labor and uh that's that's a controllable in my opinion that's something we can fix we you know we can't do much about the inflation costs and and other materials and whatnot that are dictated by that but certainly like bringing in skill sets training up the right level of people um wa is doing a very good job at it you know they're, they're forward projecting projects understanding how many labors they need to do those projects and then looking at where they can sort of fill their bucket whereas you know other states just haven't been on the ball and you look at a you know what a result of that is that we've just got Massive lags in terms of construction, very little approvals coming through. Uh, cost of builds are still going up. Um, you know, it's just it's it's we've got to do something to kind of dampen that. And in yeah. my opinion, uh, labor something we can focus on. It's a fixable thing uh, that can be. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's definitely actionable uh, to 100%. start making movements. To kind of curb yeah. it. So what I'll throw in yeah. there. Is what I'll throw in there as well is like what, what you said there is like, you know, maybe it can't directly, like, you know, we can't directly impact inflation or affect inflation, but man, if we can boost the labor force, keep wages growth from, from, you know, exploding or continuing a run and then also bring the cost of, of housing, housing costs down dude, that is going to be a direct reflection. That's going to be a direct, um, you know, directly affect inflation and, and help it pull it back from that perspective as well. Cause obviously wages growth is a massive part of it. And the real estate and construction sector is one of the biggest, if not the biggest employer in Australia. So, um, yeah, man, I think I think you're right. That that targeted that targeted migration, um, keep keep wages down, keep building that workforce in the right way, man. I, I'm with you. I think it's a it's a very strategic way of um, of bringing it back in. Uh, big Liam Corey, 4 p.m. in 2026, guys. Uh, watch it. This is hearing it here first, <laughs> or treasurer, one or the other. Mate, thank you for jumping on and joining Whoever does us. Does the planning on this country? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it, mate. Mate, thank you for jumping on and joining us, um, guys. That is a wrap for another APS Weekly News Bulletin. We have got Big Liam Corey coming in direct from Thailand, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure having you back on. Pleasure having me. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sammy and thank you listeners. No worries buddy mate thanks for jumping on. Listeners I hope you enjoyed it if you did make sure you send it on to someone else who might take some great value from it and until next week guys it's another APS weekly news bulletin on the Scouting Australia podcast. Mm -hmm.